So we're going to start with divergent boundaries. And the divergent boundaries are when plates are moving away from one another. And you can see the arrows here moving away from each other. And we have divergent boundaries at oceanic ridges. That's the most common type of divergent boundary. And that's where we get seafloor spreading. And that is something we talked about in the beginning of the lecture on plate tectonics. The other type of divergent boundary is called continental rifting. And that is when you get divergence within the continental crust. So for example, you might have like the middle of a continent that starts having rifting where you have pieces of land moving away from each other. So an example of that would be like the East African Rift Valley or the Red Sea. And continental rifting can eventually lead to the creation of new ocean basins. So the oceanic ridges really start out as continental rifting, where pieces of land are breaking apart. And then ultimately, when the divergence gets larger, it starts to form into an ocean. So these are related. It's just that continental rifting is an earlier stage and the, in the oceanic ridges is the end stage where you have a full ocean. So here is your mid-ocean ridge. That's where you have the seafloor spreading and you have the ocean plates moving away from each other. And that's again related to the ridge push and the slab pull. That was what we discussed the other day. Let's just get back to that for a second. Okay, the ridge push again is where at the mid-ocean ridge, the ocean crust is warmer, so it's a little more buoyant, so it sits higher on the mantle, whereas the older, colder part of the ocean crust is sinking more deeper down into the mantle. Like it's pushing down lower into the mantle here. So that creates a higher elevation at the ridge causing a slope. And then gravity is pushing that slab down slope. And again, the slab pull is that you have the subduction here where this piece of ocean crust collided with this piece of ocean crust and this piece was older and colder, so that's the one, and denser. So that's the one that sinks into the mantle instead of this piece of ocean crust. And then it pulls the rest of the ocean crust with it as it gets pulled down into the mantle. So that's your slab pull. Okay, so again, that's driving the spreading at the mid-ocean ridge, that ridge push and the slab pull together on either side of this ridge. And then you have a space in between here that allows for decompression melting of the rocks lower down. And then that magma fills in the gaps there, forming new basalt rocks. And because you're partially melting the ultramafic mantle rocks, you're forming mafic ocean crust. Okay, so the reason why this is mafic ocean crust or a rock called basalt is because you're partially melting the ultramafic mantle rocks. Okay, and we, we went over partial melting in the igneous chapter. Okay, so this is just a summary. So the crust thins at the mid-ocean ridge. There's less pressure on the underlying mantle, which allows for partial melting. And the mantle is made up of an ultramafic rock called peridotite. 
that's made of olivine and pyroxene, which on Bowen's reaction series were high up on the chart, high temperature minerals. So according to Bowen's reaction series, the silica rich minerals in the mantle rocks are gonna melt first at lower temperatures and therefore the partial melting of ultramethic rocks is going to release more silica rich minerals. So instead of the ocean crust being ultramethic, it's going to be mafic, which is more silica rich than the original ultramethic mantle rocks. So this is just a little review of partial melting going over why the ocean crust is basalt instead of ultramethic mantle rocks. In, instead of being ultramethic, like the mantle rocks. Okay, and while we're talking about divergent boundaries, we have these things called black smokers. Now these are hydrothermal vents that are found at some mid-ocean ridges. Now these were an interesting discovery because they show that life can exist in the middle of a deep ocean where otherwise the water is too cold and too dark for photosynthesis. And photosynthesis would be the basis of a food chain. Okay, so if you have photosynthesis of let's say plankton, that's the start of the food chain and then larger animals would eat the plankton and then larger animals eat those animals that ate the plankton. So without photosynthesis in the cold, dark middle of the deep ocean, you would probably expect there not to be any life there. So, but then it was discovered that you can have life in the middle of the deep ocean. And that's gonna be around these hydrothermal vents. So what happens is you have magmatic activity. You have magma underneath the ground, underneath the seafloor, but close to the seafloor surface. So then some of the ocean water will enter cracks in the rocks. We call them fractures. And then that water heats up because it's close to magma that's underground. And then that hot water is gonna collect dissolved materials like minerals from the rocks in the seafloor. And then the hot water with dissolved minerals gets emitted back into the ocean water. Now I wrote the hot mineral rice that's supposed to be rich. I guess I was hungry when I typed this. So the hot mineral rich water enriches the surrounding environment and supports life. So you have this water spewing out of these fractures in the seafloor and they the water is carrying a whole lot of dissolved minerals. And when the dissolved minerals touch the cold ocean water, they start to precipitate out into crystals. But also a lot of the dissolved materials act like nutrients for the living organisms. Okay, so you've got a, it's nutrient rich and then it's able to support organisms. So they like eat the black smoke? They, they are able to eat the, um, the minerals, like the dissolved minerals and elements that are coming out of that water. Okay. So it's like nutrient rich water. Yeah, kind of like how plants eat dirt, like the nutrients in dirt, they, they suck up the, like all the nutrients and things that they need from it. Yeah, so it's like from the water, when you water the plants, the water picks up the nutrients from the soil also. Okay. All right, yeah, makes sense. Now also, this kind of reminds me of people drinking like mineral water, right? Like, you know, like some spring water or mineral water has like different dissolved minerals in it. So like, um, I guess that's a similar concept. So 
So here is the sequence of ocean basins and how they develop. And this is specifically divergent boundaries. So the first stage is continental rifting. And another, I said before, but the example is the East African Rift. So here is a diagram of continental rifting. So it's pretty much just in the middle of continental crust. You start to have it fracturing and separation of the crust, where some of the crust goes one direction and the other part of the crust moves the other direction. Now, that's partly because of some ridge push, because there's magma underground, it causes a little bit of heat, so you start to have some movement where this part of the continental crust is like higher up. It kind of like up warps a little bit. And then you start to have a little bit of a continuation of the movement and the fracturing. So then you have more magmatic activity and you have eruptions of lava. And then also you have some, because of the tilting and because of like the up warped land over here, you also start to get these mountains on the side. And as you can see, they're volcanic. So you get these volcanic mountains on either side of that rift zone. You have lava coming out in the middle, and now you have this depression in the middle. So sometimes large lakes can actually form in those depressions in the middle of the rift zones. So then the rift zone opens wider, you have more volcanism occur, and instead of a large lake, you start filling in more water, potentially from a sea that might be connected to this area. And I'll show you that in one of the next slides. So as the rift zone opens wider, and you get more basaltic volcanism and more water filling in the basin, that's going to be more like the Red Sea. So that's the second type of stage in this scenario. Okay, so first it's like the East African Rift, then it would be like the Red Sea, and then a continuation of the basalt eruptions and a continuation of the spreading of these two pieces of land away from each other eventually will lead to the opening and the formation of an ocean basin. And then the middle here would, would become a mid-ocean ridge. And that would be like the Atlantic Ocean as an example. So this is another diagram showing you a similar concept. But first you have the lithosphere is starting to stretch and fracture. And on the edges, you have a little bit of an up warp and some formation of mountains. And a, like um, these rift, this is the rift zone in the middle. But you have like these areas of land where it's higher elevation on either side. And then you have a development of volcanism and your rifting is continuing to open up wider and wider. And then you start to form lakes in the depressions in here. See like here, this is a lake or it says basin. That's some sort of large lake or maybe even a sea. And then a continuation of that rifting eventually will create a mid-ocean ridge. You have a wide ocean basin, and then you still have that el higher elevation rift zone remnants on the edges. Okay, you see how it's still a higher elevation on the edges. You now, when we look in the middle of this diagram here and we have a volcanic mountain, that 
would be like Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. Okay, so you have a volcanic mountain and you have a large basin of water nearby. So let's look at a map here. You have Mount Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro and Lake Victoria. Here's another lake over here. Okay, this is the East African Rift Valley. I don't know if you can see that. It says East Rift Valley. Okay, so that's your East African Rift Valley. So you have your Lake Victoria on one side and Mount Kilimanjaro on the other side of the Rift Valley. This map down here shows you where Tanzania is and then it shows you Lake Victoria is right there. Okay, and then here's a picture of Mount Kilimanjaro. Okay, so again, that's this situation going on here. The volcanic mountain, and then you have a large basin of water. Okay, so that's showing that the East African rift fits nicely into the model of continental rifting. And then here's another diagram showing you the same thing. It just shows you in a different way. So I like to show a bunch of diagrams. You might like one diagram better than the other, so we'll show all of them. Okay, so again, continental rifting occurs when plate motions produce opposing tension forces. Tension means pulling apart. Okay, and then here's your up warping of the rocks related to the upwelling of the mantle. Here's your continental rifting. Here you're starting to form that basin in the middle. This would be like the Red Sea because you have more of a linear sea rather than just small lakes on the side. I know I said they were large lakes, but I mean small as compared to the Red Sea or any other sea that eventually would turn into an ocean. So this situation is actually how the Atlantic Ocean formed. It has to do with when Pangaea broke apart. Okay, so like the top picture would be Pangaea, and then you started to break apart the land and have rifting, and then it would have formed a linear sea, and then eventually the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so again, the East African Rift Valley and the Red Sea represent different stages in the evolution of a divergent plate boundary. So the East African Rift Zone is these dashed lines. Okay, and these red triangles are volcanoes. So the East African Rift Valley is being formed by the separation of Eastern Africa from the rest of the continent along a divergent plate boundary. It represents an early stage of rifting. Okay, and then you have the typical large lakes. You have a whole bunch of lakes in here, actually. Some are smaller, some are bigger. You see, it's a whole lot of lakes in here. The Red Sea represents a more advanced stage of rifting in which two continental blocks, Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, are separated by a narrow sea. So here in the Red Sea, you have this um, bold, not bold, um, solid gray line that represents a plate boundary. So here you have the Arabian plate and the African plate are separating. So here's your narrow, long, or linear sea. Okay, so that's the Red Sea. Then you have the Gulf of Aden. The Gulf of Aden has actually progressed to having some seafloor spreading. So that's a more progressed stage of the model. 
because it's a little bit wider and there's seafloor spreading that goes on in there. Okay, and then this shows you the formation of the basaltic ocean crust. So here's the Red Sea, and then here's the Gulf of Aden, and you can see a more substantial amount of ocean crust. It's a wider basin full of ocean crust. So it's like the East African Rift would be the beginning of the stages. The Red Sea is a little bit more of a progressed stage of rifting, and then the Gulf of Aden is a more progressed stage of rifting. And here's another picture of the model of rifting. And again, you have the volcanic mountains on either side. You have a higher elevation on either side of the rift valley. We call this a rift valley, by the way. So it's a higher elevation on either side. And then you would have a lake or a linear sea related to it. So again, Lake Victoria and Mount Kilimanjaro. And then you have the magma activity causing the volcanism. Now here is Iceland. If you look at this map here, Iceland is an island, but it's on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Okay, it's on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So I'm just going to go all the way back to this map of the bathymetry of the ocean floor. So here's Greenland, here's Europe, here is Iceland, and here is the mid-ocean ridge. Okay, so it goes all the way down like that. So that's the mid-ocean ridge, and Iceland is on it. Okay, so you have divergence happening along the whole Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So Iceland is volcanic. And here is a sketch of the Rift Valley related to Iceland. So in, in, I, that's sort of in the middle of the island is a Rift Valley. And you can see, it's a little difficult to see, but there's an arrow going this way and an arrow going that way. They're kind of like in lighter colored yellow. And then here is a photo of the Rift Valley in Iceland. And you can see the rocks here are uplifted, which would be similar to the uplifted edges of the valley in these diagrams that I showed you. And then here's your rift valley. So you would expect some volcanism happening in here. Now also something else about Iceland is that there, whoops, there's, um, there's hot springs. Sorry, ah, I'm all over the place here. Okay, so there's hot springs in Iceland and that's related to the magmatic activity close to the land surface. So the magma underground allows for heating of water, like surface water and groundwater. So that causes these hot springs. And you can actually um, go swimming in some of them. I don't know how much swimming actually happens. I think people just kind of sit in them and relax and enjoy the heat. But... Um, yeah, and the hot springs have a lot of um, dissolved minerals, actually, in them. For example, like dissolved silica is in the water. So I know someone who actually went in one of the hot springs there, and they were told to put conditioner in their hair first before going in the water because of the the silica does something, I guess it coats your hair and makes it feel weird or something, I don't know. 
but she said that's what they were told. So put conditioner. Okay, so then we're done with divergent boundaries. Now we're gonna talk about convergent boundaries. So there are three types of convergent boundaries. And again, convergent boundaries are when plates are going towards each other. So you have oceanic to continental boundaries, oceanic to oceanic, and continental to continental boundaries. And I will go over each of those. So first, oceanic to oceanic, I'm sorry, oceanic to continental. So when ocean crust and continental crust collide, the oceanic crust sinks into the mantle and subducts beneath the continental crust. So here you have continental crust, which is thicker. And here is the ocean crust, which is thinner. Ocean crust is denser. So the ocean crust is dense and therefore able to sink into the mantle. Continental crust is too buoyant, so it can't sink into the mantle. And again, that's like if you were to try and sink a piece of styrofoam in a pool of water, you can't get the, the styrofoam to go into the water. Okay, so con that's because the styrofoam is buoyant. So you can't have continental crust sink into the mantle. Only ocean crust does that. So the, the ocean crust sinks into the mantle here. Then you have some partial melting over here. And then you have volcanism. And the volcanism will result in volcanic mountains. And we call that a volcanic arc which is really a line of volcanic mountains. So we call that a volcanic arc mountain range. For example, the Andes Mountains in South America and the, Cas the Cascade Mountain Range in Western North America. So when you're destroying this ocean crust and then you have some partial melting and then the volcanism is actually going to give you intermediate composition magma, and the rocks would be called andesite. So here is an example in North America where the ocean crust of the Juan de Fuca plate is sinking into the mantle beneath the North American plate. And we could just go back for a second. When you look more closely, this is where we're looking here. So this is the Juan de Fuca plate, and this is the North American plate. So this little tiny plate is colliding and subducting beneath the North American plate in this location, and that forms the Cascade Mountains. And when you look at this, you see, for example, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier. Has anyone heard of Mount St. Helens before? No. Okay. Yeah, I've heard it. I just don't recall where exactly I heard it from. Okay. So Mount St. Helens has actually erupted. And when you, if you actually, um, if you go back to the igneous chapter, let me just do that for a second. So in the igneous chapter, we talked a little bit about volcanoes and volcanoes in North America. So one of the examples was the Mount St. Helens eruption. This occurred in 1980 in this photo, and this is all ash, it's not snow. It's all ash covering the ground. Okay, so that is this same Mount St. Helens. It's a volcanic mountain. It's not active all the time, but 
it is a volcano and that's related to this island this volcanic arc okay the volcanic arc mountain range that's this and that's this eruption here And then here are the Andes Mountains, which is related to the subduction along the west coast of South America. So you have the Andes Mountains. And then you have the Peru-Chile Trench. So trenches are that little V-shaped dip here This whole thing is the trench right here. And that is where the subduction zone is occurring and where the ocean crust is bending downward. That dip that results is your trench. And that actually could end up being really deep water. So like in this, this is a satellite image you can see the depth represented by the shadow. It's like really shaded right there. So that's the very deep ocean water right off the coast of South America next to the Andes Mountains. Now the word Andes is similar to andesite. Okay, so that's a good way of like remembering the two. Okay, so when we're looking at the oceanic to oceanic boundaries, and you have the older, colder, denser ocean crust sinks into the mantle and subducts beneath the younger, warmer, less dense oceanic plate. And then it forms this trench here. Again, that's the deepest part of the ocean is generally where the trenches happen. And then you form this volcanic island arc, which is a line of volcanic islands because you're in the middle of the ocean here. So some examples of these types of boundaries include the Aleutian Islands, Japan, the Philippines, and the Antilles. So here are the greater Antilles in this map, the lesser Antilles. Those are related to subduction. Okay, so a lot of the Caribbean islands are part of a volcanic island arc. Okay, and here is a trench formed related to subduction. And you can see it's deep as indicated by the shading of this picture. Okay, and then here we have the trench. Right, this is where you have the subducting slab. Again, that's your deep ocean. And then you have partial melting of this subducting plate. And then you have magma that rises to the surface and forms these volcanic islands. So it's a volcanic arc, but they're islands. So we call it a volcanic island arc. Trenches are the deepest part of the ocean and can be five to almost seven miles deep. Okay, so a summary of the volcanic mountains that form at subduction zones. A volcanic arc is when continental crust and ocean crust collide. A volcanic island arc is when two pieces of ocean crust collide. And then here is a summary of subduction zones. In this picture, it is a collision between ocean crust and continental crust. So ocean crust is the denser, thinner, mafic rock. And on this side, it's the continental crust, which is thicker, less dense, and felsic. And then as this ocean crust is subducting, you have ocean sediments that are getting scraped off of this ocean crust as it subducts. 
and it accumulates in a wedge called an accretionary prism. So this is your wedge. And you could see that on some of the previous diagrams. Here you've got this little yellow area here. That's ocean sediment that gets scraped off as this plate moves downward. Okay, so that's your accretionary wedge. Okay. So again, here's another diagram of the accretionary wedge, also called accretionary prism. Okay, so as this piece of ocean crust sinks into the mantle, next to the continental crust, it's being, the ocean sediment is being scraped off of the descending plate. So it accumulates here. Then third, we have a continental to continental boundary. These originally begin as oceanic to continental convergence, but the continents eventually collide and ocean basins eventually can close up as the ocean crust is consumed in the subduction process and then the continents ultimately collide. So 70 million years ago, this is where India was located further south in the Indian Ocean, not connected to Asia yet. And then as India kept moving northward, there was subduction here. Okay, so there was ocean crust in front of India as India was moving towards Asia, that ocean crust subducted beneath the Eurasian plate. Then eventually, that ocean crust was consumed in the subduction process and recycled and destroyed. And then eventually, after all the subduction, India, the continental crust of India, was able to collide with Asia. So here you have India still not connected to the Eurasian plate. You have the subduction happening. You have the melting and the continental volcanic arc, which now is around the area of the Tibetan Plateau. Okay, so this is like before India collided with Asia. You have your accretionary wedges here and some continental shelf sediments here, okay? So eventually all of this sediment and the area in here, the area in here, all of this got involved in the formation of the Himalayan mountains. So then here is where the Indian plate is now collided with the, the Eurasian plate. All of those rocks are now in the Himalayan mountains and in the plain and the plateau surrounding the mountains. And then here is the suture. The suture shows you where the plates are different. So like on this side of the suture is the Eurasian plate and this side of the suture is the Indian plate. But now they're touching because of the collision. And there's no more subduction happening. You'd still do have movement though, but there's not really any subduction happening because I, I, I don't think there's any subduction happening at all. Um, pretty much most of the ocean crust was already consumed in the previous subduction. So continental to continental boundaries, there is no subduction. Neither plate is going to go into the mantle because you have continental crust colliding with continental crust. Neither pieces of continental crust are able to sink into the mantle. They're not dense enough. The crust thickens and you end up with a mountain range. And then, like the previous picture, the remnant of the previous subduction is still shown here. 
ignore the fact that there's an arrow there because that's what I was seeing. There's not really any subduction still happening. So they really shouldn't, there shouldn't really be an arrow there. Okay, but this is showing you in the past, the ancient subduction happening. So it's showing you the arrow that way, but there's no movement now going down that way. It's just showing you like the remnant of this, the ancient subduction. Okay, so here is a review. You can label the diagrams below with the type of convergent plate boundary that is represented. So again, there were three types of convergent plate boundaries. Okay, so take a minute and label each of these. Okay, and remember that continental crust is thicker and ocean crust is thinner. Okay, so take a minute and then we will go over your answers. Is B ocean to ocean subduction? Yes, ocean to ocean. Whoops, ocean to ocean. Good. Continental to continental. For which one? D. Wait, which one? D. Cat. Oh. Continental to continental. Yes. And what is A? Ocean to continental. Ocean to continental. Okay, good job, everyone. Okay, so take note of the answers. Okay, and then we have transform boundaries. And this is when plates slide laterally past each other in opposite directions. So here you have this yellow arrow coming toward us and this yellow arrow going away. In opposite directions we could add okay and these types of boundaries result in the formation of transform faults for example the san andreas fault in california is a transform fault so at transform boundaries crust is neither created nor destroyed earthquakes occur but there is no volcanism related there is no volcanism because you're not destroying any crust. So you're not getting melting involved. Nothing is sinking into the mantle. It's all just at the surface going next to each other, but opposite directions, okay? So earthquakes can occur, but there is no volcanism. So this is a summary of the tectonic settings where magma can be generated. Divergent boundaries at spreading centers, for example, like the Mid-Ocean Ridge, you get mafic lava, and that comes from the partial melting of ultramafic mantle rocks. Convergent boundaries, only ones with subduction zone convergence, meaning not related to two continents colliding where there's no magma involved at all. You're gonna get lava of intermediate composition. And that's because you get partial melting of mafic ocean crust, the mantle and continental crust that it comes in contact with. You can sometimes get felsic magma as well. Okay, so divergent boundaries is mostly mafic Convergent boundaries is mostly related to intermediate and sometimes felsic. So now we're going to just go over the evidence of rifting in our local area. So there was local evidence for continental rifting related to when Pangaea broke apart. And the evidence is volcanism that is associated with continental rifting 
that happened about 190 million years ago. And we know the age because the rocks have been dated. So these are basalt rocks on the William Patterson University campus. And the basalt rocks in the area have been dated at 190 million years old. So the mafic lava that we see in parts of New Jersey, including the Wachung Mountains, which are really just lava flows, the pillow basalt that we talked about in the igneous chapter, there were pillow basalts in Patterson, New Jersey, also the Palisade Sill, Yes, this is columnar jointing, right? Which is further evidence that this is basalt. So all of these different examples of mafic lava is all related to the continental rifting that occurred locally. And this is all related to when Pangaea broke apart. Okay, so down here we have Pangaea. And then you had Pangaea started to fracture in different locations. But locally, we had some fracturing and the formation of two different rift systems. So this would be like the East African rift that we see today. So we had what's called the Newark Basin and the Atlantic Graben. So the Newark Basin, about 200 million years ago, that's the late Triassic, was an active rift system. Again, just similar to the East African rift today. So you had volcanism, which is the red, okay? You had magma and lava activity. And then over here in the Atlantic Graben, you also had an active rift system. And then in the late Triassic, 160 million years ago, the Newark Basin then stopped rifting. Okay, so it's no it was no longer an active rift system, but the rocks still remain. Okay, you still have the volcanic rocks in that area. But the Atlantic system continued, and it's still continuing today. Eventually, it opened up and turned into the entire Atlantic Ocean, and now we have the Mid-Ocean Ridge, which is pretty far from where we are right now. And here's another look at the same thing. So this shows you the mafic igneous rocks. And the rocks are tilted on a slight angle. And it's a little bit, the, the tilting is partially related to the rifting. Okay, um, but here you have, this is a sill, okay, this, this sill is actually exposed over here next to the George Washington Bridge, and this is the Palisades sill. So most of the sill is underground, but at the George Washington Bridge at the Hudson River, you're able to see like the edge of the Palisades sill. And then here you have the Wachung Mountains, which are lava flows. So the orange mountain basalt was the first lava flow. And then later on, you had the Preakness basalt, which is a little bit younger. And then you had the Hook Mountain basalt, which is younger. So these are your Wachung Mountains. And in between, the yellow is all sediment, like sandstone, shale, and siltstone. And here, um, Orange Mountain is in Patterson. Preakness is actually where William Patterson University is located, like on top of the Preakness basalt. So here is some basalt on the William Patterson campus. This up here is your lava flow and the rocks below this line right here. Okay, this is the bottom of the lava flow. Below that is sedimentary rocks. 
Okay, and when you look here, you do have sedimentary rocks beneath the lava flows, which is yellow. The lava flows is black. Okay, so right here, you do have, you can actually see that contact between the lava and the sedimentary rocks. And then here is some vesicular basalt that is actually also from William Patterson campus. So it shows you volcanic eruption evidence. And then here you have pillow basalts in the Orange Mountain basalt in Patterson, New Jersey. The presence of pillow lava tells us there was a body of water there. It would have been a similar large lake, uh, similar to Lake Victoria related to the East African Rift Zone today. Okay, so there was a large lake locally related to that continental rifting. And again, the evidence is the pillow basalt. And then here's your Palisades sill. Again, this is the edge. This is like the edge of it that you're able to see sticking out. It's actually a rock called diabase, which is similar to basalt, but because it forms a little, it forms underground, so it's a sill, so it's intrusive, but it's so close to the surface that it's a little bit extrusive as well. So the grain size is very small. So we call it, it's very small, but it's visible. So we call it diabase. Okay, so just, it's, it's similar to basalt. It has the same composition, but the grain size is a little bit larger than basalt. Okay, so we call that diabase. So that's here.